Oh, yes. Hello. So I am Gloria Mark. No, I'm kidding. Um, so that's just how I got your. That's how I was getting. That's how I got your. That's how I was getting people to pay. So before before I introduce our honored speaker for today, honored speaker for today. Um, I wanted to encourage people to please stick around. After the talk, it, it, there's going to be a break, but at 3.30, we're going to have a, at 3.30, we're going to have a special participate, the more fun it will be. So please stick around. Um, and so, and so now to introduce, um, so it's my absolute pleasure to speaker, um, a person who is dear to all of us. And so if you don't know me, my name is Brian Saman, and I worked with Gloria from 2005 through 2011. And I am now a professor at the University of Colorado, University of Colorado at Boulder. Someone who was being mentored by Gloria, something she used to always say to us was, whenever we had an idea, was go for it. We had an idea, was go for it. <laughs> um, and so like whenever it me to give it a go, no matter what. Um, this perhaps best, best exemplifies who Gloria is. We all know how remarkably brilliant she is. But beyond her intellectual prowess, I have always seen Gloria as someone, I have always seen Gloria as someone who is extremely creative, adventurous. She has a very pioneering spirit. Um, and from her world travels to the myriad project, projects she has pursued, she always goes for it. Um, having received degrees in biostatistics and, in biostatistics and psychology, and I, what I learned today also at art, she could have continued on as a researcher in the more traditional canon of cognitive psychology. But she chose to forge a path in human computer interaction. As an HCI scholar, no project has been out of reach. Reach. Um, we often say all trades, master of none. <laughs> well, Gloria is a jack of all trades, master of all. Um, from experimental design to ethnographic research to integrating the use of sensors in her work, and her deep use of and her deep use of and development of theory, any tool she wants to use, she masters those tools. She goes for it. And she goes for it. Include stand and address very critical and common struggle with, like managing our attention in this multimediated world, multimediated world. And so now it is my turn to tell you, Gloria. Go. <laughs> Well, I, I have to say that it, it is a privilege and an honor to be back here, back here speaking to all of you. Um, at the end, I'm, I'm going to give my thanks to everyone. So I'm going to just dive everyone. So I'm going to just dive in now. In the early 2000s, the World Health, or Health Organization identification identified stress epidemic of the 21st century. This is before COVID. This is before COVID hit, and I, and I would say that's relevant. Now, there's a lot of things that cause stress, but one of them, one one part of this is the digital world that we live in. And I'm going to talk about the different way talk about the different ways that using our devices create stress. So here's 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 the starting premise. You know, throughout Egypt, technology was designed to extend human, cap human capabilities with computers and smartphones and NAI. But despite the fact that we have access to more information and more people than we've ever had before in history in this digital age, ultimately the human mind is still a bottleneck. It puts a limit. To, it puts a limit to how much information we can actually process. Be able to, um, you know, produce so much more info, much more information for us, and maybe you can argue that agents interact with each other in processing the information. But ultimately, it but ultimately it has. There's still a bottleneck, a limitation to what we can process. So it so it has to do with our attention. And think about attention. I always go back to the first person who actually defined it as a psychologist, and this is William James, who's known as the father of psychology. Here's what he wrote about it. He said, everyone knows what attention is. It's the taking, it's the taking possession by the mind, focalization of consciousness are of its essence. So this is an intuitive definition, right? We all know attention is, 
Attention is when you, you know, put all your focus on one particular thing, one particular thing. But I'm going to talk about how it's a lot, right? It's way more nuanced. <laughs> so yes, the human mind is a bottleneck. Why is that the case? It's because people have a limited a limited amount of resources. You can also think of it as limited attentional capacity. Now, now it turns out, you know, this is a theory that's been around for you know 50 years. People like Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman have been uh, talking, and it turns out that there's actually a neuroscience basis to this this abstract to this this abstract ideal. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that. Uh, imaging shows that when people are that when people are focused, the blood flows to the brain in the act uh, that appears in the image, and in the image, and what happens is that carbon dioxide is, and so the blood vessels dilate to uh, to uh, take care of this carbon di dioxide, and as people get fatigued, the velocity of blood flow, the velocity of blood flow. So blood flow in the brain seems to be a metabolic index of how this this, ab this abstract idea of cognitive resources is being, and it can explain uh, focus. Focus. Now we've also known from that attention is affected by multiple factors. Lots of things. This is lots of things. This is even. System two is more just thought. Uh, I will address the elephant in the room, which is algorithms. Everyone says, yes, the algorithms steal our attention. Yes, they do. It's not the full story. Uh, 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 platforms like email, and say, yes, they affect our attention because of their social nature. And I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, people have individual differences in how much they're distracted, how much they can pay attention, they can pay attention. Uh, people are born lucky, have a trait for good self-regulation. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone is born so lucky. So some people really have to struggle. I will talk about how, and this might be, this might be surprising to some of you, but I will maintain that the design of the internet itself was designed uh, for, was designed uh, poor distraction. And then computers and smartphones. I'm going to talk about how I, how I believe the broader media environment of film, TV uh, affects how we pay attention. So with uh, an example, emotions play a role. 
So this was a, labor was a laboratory study we did. Uh, we had subjects to the laboratory in one condition. They worked on a task. They worked on a task, no interruptions, and then they worked on a second task. In the other condition, right, the same, right, the same person, and of course, we counterbalance the order in which we do. The other person is working on a test. Sorry, the other, in, sorry, the other in the other condition, the person is working continually getting interrupted, right? We videotaped their faces, taped their faces. We performed detection using software, and the image on the left. And the image on the left is the person doing just the the one task and then switching, and the software detects the expression as being neutral. In the two images on the right, the person is in the multitasking condition, condition, and the software detects as being angry. I mentioned that unconscious actions affect. How we pay attention with our devices. So for those of you, for those of you with a background in psychology, and I know some of you have, you know about controlled processing, which is the when you deliver, which is the when you deliberately pay attention effort. Uh, so for example, you're reading a reading a document or you're writing a document. That's controlled processing. We also do things unconsciously, like you see, like. You see your phone lying on the table and you grab it and you get a notification on your screen. You click on it, you click on it. Even within ourselves, we we have this urge now or social media or the news, right? This is automatic, right? This is automatic process. We just can't help ourselves, but do it. What? <clears throat> is my laptop muted? I mean, hold on. Is that good? Yes. Okay. So um, I was trained in, in psychology. Psychology. And what typically happens is you bring people into a laboratory, you create a laboratory, you create an abstract model of the world. You do the variables that you're really not interested in so that you can really focus on the variable of interest. But I realized that you know we live in a technological world. Our lives are so our lives are so embedded with the use of device. Hard to separate ourselves and you know put people into a laboratory to measure how they use devices. How can you possibly model things like stress and career career trajectories and clicks that you just had? You just but to so to really understand tech use. I feel we have to study people where they are in their natural, real working habitats, personal, personal, and and work. And so um, we've created living laboratories where we use a variety of toys, where we use a variety of different kinds of sensors to be screen switches, so we can get a sense of how long people's attention duration, attention duration is on any screen. We've used heart rate monitors. To measure heart rate variability, which is rate variability, which is in the interest. Um, more recently, we have wearable uh, uh, watches. Uh, we've used uh, sense cams where we take photos, continual photos of um, as people are um, as people are moving around. Uh, software to detect whether a face appears in the image or not, and you get a pretty pretty good idea of whether people had a face-to-face -face interaction. We in sampling where people report their subjective their subjective perceptions of what they're experiencing over. And then we give people a battery of different kinds of tests like personality tests, um, measuring um, measuring chronic stress. Together all these measures in time so that so that at any point in time, we get a we try to get a comprehensive picture of what people's mood is, their behavior, their attention. Um, so, so this is uh, the approach of using living living laboratories. So now I'm going to punch line here. 
which is what did we find when we measure people's attention duration on a screen? Uh, when I started doing this work, this was back. This was back in um, in um, first published in with my student Victor Gonzalez, and we, we used to follow and we, we used to follow people around with stopwatches. Activity, you click the stopwatch, note the time, you know, so they would uh, move move from a, a Word doc that would stop time, then they'd pick up the phone, start time, pick up the phone, start time. We did that a very later and people averaged about 150 seconds, about two and a half, about two and a half minutes on any computer screen switching. Um, in 2012, Steve Voida, 2012, Steve Voida, the earlier session, Steve talked about, he came up with this idea, hey, you know, we can use software logging to be able to log people's screen switches. So we can't use that and found people average 75 seconds on a screen before switching. And more recently, the last uh, six years or so, we find that people's attention reached a steady state, reached a steady state. Also, others have replicated this. Um, 48, 48 seconds, 47. Andres Meyer, who's still in, found 50 seconds on average. Fatima Akbar and her just, Fatima Akbar and her just, the information workers over 30 days, found people averaged 44 seconds. But altogether, it, but altogether, it averages about 47 seconds when you uh, different studies. So people's attention, you know, all day, every day averages to about 47 seconds on any screen. And if you're wondering, and if you're wondering what this looks like broken, so first of all, all computer use of median value is 40 seconds. So that's not too far away seconds. So that's not too far away from 47 seconds. So the observations we found were less than 40 seconds seconds on any screen, and of course, are longer. And of course, you know, email productivity software like Word and Excel and Word and Excel and so on, people average a little bit longer, or, uh, it's pretty short. And another way, way to convey these results are to when they switch. Uh, people switch their screens, bash their screens about 66 times a day. This is a day. These are information workers. Uh, we found that we found that people check email about 77 times. Uh, this was work done with with uh, Mary Shervin, uh, Mary Shervinsky and colleagues. At, um, and a year earlier, we found 74 times a day. So you know we replicated it. For those people who were Facebook users. They Facebook on average 38 times a day, at least the, when, the year that at least the, when, the year that we did the study. Not sure what it would be, maybe Instagram. It turns out, and this was work done, and this was work done with this was doing, you know, shadowing where we would observe people, observe people, that about half of all interruptions are self-initiated. They come from within an individual. What does this look like? So you're observing someone, and then for no apparent reason, right? There's no external stimulus, external stimulus. There's no notification, no phone call is observable, but the person suddenly stops, say work, suddenly stops, say working on a Word document, and they make up the phone, but they do something else. So we call these self, these self interruptions, and they have interruptions, and they happen about urge <laughs> to do something, or a memory of something they forgot to do, of something they forgot to do, or habitual. This slide is a bit of a diversion, so it's not related to attention, but I just thought it was so interesting that I, I just wanted to throw it in. So we found that not that we found that not only did people's attention duration on a screen decrease over the last 20 years, we also find also find that people's uh, percent of sedentary behavior workday has increased. And you know these are really early, these are really early studies, 90s, um, 80s. This is really before computers entered um, the majority of workplaces. So people spent a pretty low percentage of time at the desk. There's a lot of walking around, going to meetings. Um, 
The study done in 2019, uh, this is the data swing was the lead on this. This was the lead on this. This was, um, it was called the Tesseray project where we, and Ted, we, and Ted, where's Ted? Ted worked on that as well. Uh, we tracked 750 people, 50 people across. And we found that during the work day, they spent about 90% of their day at sedentary. So not moving around. So just wanted to show you that. Okay. So now, you know, I want to talk about some myths about attention on our computers because computers, because these are myths that have heard the popular narrative. And, and I want to shed some light on this. And the first myth, that's and the first myth, and you hear this a lot. Well, you know, we've got more productive. Let's be as focused as long, long as possible on our computers. And if you do some Googling, you'll see advertisements like this, advertisements like this, how to stay focused for long periods of, if you read this, you'll be able to focus for hours. Um, there's an organization called Nonstop Focus. Right? <laughs> People make, you know, they make good money. They make good money as consultants promise of getting focus, you know, extended periods of time. Well, you know, you know, it turns out we're human. We have limitations, limited cognitive resources. It's just not humanly, just not humanly possible to focus for long periods of time on tasks that require mental effort. And hold on to that idea because I'm going to get to it. There's also this idea that attention just that attention just has two states, right? You're focused, focused. You're engaged with something or you're not engaged with something or you're not engaged with. Put this because there's for different tasks and different tasks and different things we do, we exert mental effort. And so this was an attentional theoretical framework uh, worked on with Mary Shabinsky and Shamsi Iqbal at, Michael, at Microsoft Research. And the idea behind that is that um, you can be engaged in something and you can put engaged in something and you can put in a lot of mental effort. Like when you're writing a piece of paper, trying to understand, it, right? You can also, also be really engaged with, really engaged with something challenge like playing solitaire or, or playing candy crush or, or playing candy crush or, you know, my current favorite. I mean, there's a lot of things that people do where you can just really be engaged and it's not effortful at all. And so we decided that there's two really, there's two really important dimensions to be considered when we talk. The first is how engaged someone is. Are they highly, highly engaged or not at all engaged? But also how challenged are you? Are you really challenged or not at all challenged? At all challenged. And so we pour labels. If you're really engaged and you're really challenged, we label this a state of focus. Remember, it's, it's just a label. Uh, if you're really engaged, but you're just not at all challenged, like playing Candy Crush, browsing social media, we call that rote attention to indicate, you know, that it's to indicate, you know, that it's a rote task. But again, it's not challenged and you're not engaged. We call that a state of boredom, that a state of boredom. And if you're really challenged and you're engaged, we call that frustrated attention. An example is attention. An example is when I, when I can't solve it, I really get frustrated. I am not engaged, but I have to I have to solve it or I can't use my device. So I'm pretty so we did a study in the workplace where we probed people throughout the day. We did it. 18 times a day, and the irony does not escape, not escape me that we interrupted 18 times a day. We got really great data. And we asked people to, and we asked people two very simple questions, like how engaged was doing and how challenged were you in the thing you were just doing doing? People responded a couple of sentence, a uh, couple of seconds, 
and we would get a timestamp. So we could really, you know, we could really, you know, see their probes, their answers. And here's what we found. So with uh, information workers, first thing I want to say is hardly anyone responded being frustrated. So that's that's why that that's that's why that curve is not on this graph. Fine. If you look at when people responded being highly engaged and highly challenged, in other words, being focused, we find there needs to be rhythms, right? There's a, a peak time, which peak time, which is like mid, and then it kind of wanes, and then there's another peak time mid afternoon, and this seems to correspond with the ebb and flow of our cognitive resources, you know. And if people don't start out their day, you know, day, you know, ramped up, ready to go, in high focus. They do some work. You check email. You do other kinds of things, maybe to get people to things maybe to get people in or so on. And of course, there are everything we know from psychology and HCI is that there are, that there are individual differences. Chronotypes are important. If you're in chronotype, your peak focus times will be much earlier. Times will be much earlier. If you're only until yeah, maybe 11 o'clock, we know your peak times will be later. So this idea, this myth, we should be to be focused as long as possible on our computers. Our computers. Well, it just doesn't work that way. That when people get cognitively fatigued, it affects their ability. Affects their ability to have cognitive. And we can't. We just can't focus long. Focus long hours. We can't achieve sustained long focusically lift weights all day without getting exhausted. So it's really important to understand that attention seems to follow natural rhythms. And these are individual, individual. So let me talk about, and that the myth is, you know, multitasking is good. We can do more, more when we multitask. We can perform better. There are three reasons why this uh, does, not, uh, does not work. Reason. And we know this from decades of laboratory research in psychology, people make more errors when they multitask. Uh, there was actually a study, an in situ study of physicians. And of course, you, as you can imagine, physicians shift their attention a lot. They get interrupted very often uh, from, you know, patients. Uh, from, you know, patient beepers and nurses. And in this study, it was found that when the physicians were, physicians were multitasking, they made more errors. In fact, 200 of 239 prescriptions that were written, 12 of those were written, 12 of those were... Quite. We also know that sleep affects things. And for those physicians who had poor sleep, it led to a 15-fold increase in the clinical error rate when they were multitasking. Next thing, uh, multitasking uh, takes us longer to do things. Why? There's a switch cost, right? Right. Because every time you switch tasks, you are into another uh, task. I like to use this metaphor of an internal whiteboard of the internal whiteboard of the mind. Every time you start at a new task of that task, and so imagine that you gather up all the information you need, right, in this mental model for the task you're doing. And then suddenly you switch to something else. So you're erasing that internal white, erasing that internal whiteboard, and you're writing up, you know, the new information, new tasks, like checking email, and then you switch again. So you're re erasing, rewriting, erasing, rewriting. And just like on an, a real whiteboard, you can't sometimes erase, sometimes erase everything. Sometimes you see a residue. And you go to the news and you read some horrific account. And then that stays in your mind, and then you try to switch to another task, and you're still thinking of that horrific accident. So that's a switch. That's a switch cost. It inter with uh, the next task we're doing. And then the, the, the nail in the coffin. Is, then the, the, the nail in the coffin is that multitasking cost. First of all, in lab studies, these not my studies, but uh, my studies, but other studies showed there's higher systolic pressure. When people are given multitasking of uh, a task, tasking of uh, a task, there's a physiological indicator will have higher stress. 
Um, in work that we've done, where we've done, where we ask people to subjectively report stress on the dated scales, people report higher perceived stress at the perceived stress at those times. The software logging shows them to be switching their attention the most. So, so multitasking leads to a vicious cycle. We get interrupted, so we're switching attention. The interruptions, attention, the interruptions could be from within ourselves. This our, our poor executive function is working overtime, uh, and of course stress, uh, and of course stress. And when our it's you know magnificent job of filtering out distractions, out distractions, it makes us even more susceptible to and distractions. So we get into this vicious cycle. Uh, and let me cover the last myth, which is that rote activity is not useful for us. So rote activity is, so rote activity is you know, think of mindless activity and every this, you need to be productive. Well, let me sh show you the opinion of Maya Angelou, the great writer and poet. She talks about her big mind, her big mind and her little, and with her big mind, she could you know, this is what she used for writing and for her deep thoughts. But she also had what she called a little mind where she would pull away from her writing. And she would do these kinds of rote tasks like crossword puzzles or she played solitaire. And this allowed her cognitive resources to cognitive resources to replenish, to build back up. It also turns out that we're happiest, we're happiest when we do road activity. It's not so like we're doing things that are, we're, it's engaging, it's easy aging, it's easy. Of course we like it, right? But people are happiest doing road activity, happier than happier than being focused on, on of course, bored. So road activity can play a role and road activity doesn't have to be online. It could be knitting. There's one guy I talked to who has this ball in his office, he throws it on a screen and, you know, that helps, helps him just unwind, replenish. Um, but of course, if you're someone who gets stuck in rabbit holes, when you pulls, when you play games or go on social media, be realistic, set a timer, do that. Okay, so now I want to talk about how our distractions, interruptions, multitasking, they're, they're due, they're, they're due to more than just algorithm of discipline. And we've we've heard from you know many, many different people that you know blame it on the algorithms, blame it on the tech companies. Yes, yes, they are at fault, but it's not the only the only reason. We are subject to all the social, environmental, and technological influences uh, in our attention. We live in a digital world. We can't separate our, you know, the stuff we do, what we do during the dives from using our tech and it affects our attention. But, but let me address the algorithms. Well, um, you probably all know that everything we do on the web, we do on the web, all the digital traces we leave, it's captioned <laughs> profiles of us are constructed and constructed. And you know there's intense competition by tech companies to capture your mind's limited real real estate. So you know algorithms are designed to be as accurate as possible in getting your in getting your interest. Remarketing is done where you're presented with ads in different contexts. So if I if I click on a pair of boots on um, the, yeah. the examples, right? And you know, I just said, no, nah, I'm and you know, I just said, no, nah, I'm not gonna buy them, but those boots will follow. And then I'm, I'm reading an article in say Rolling Stone magazine, and I see the ad and I see the ad for the boots, the boots, and you might be more, you know, inclined to just buy to just buy them. Algorithms tend to our lower order emotions. So these are things like fear and anger, very basic emotions that we have. And it triggers automatic behavior. Again, system one, again, system one. These are, we can't help but respond of ads and notifications that, that trigger these kinds of 
um, emotions. Um, for example, Facebook got into a lot of trouble because they promoted angry, angry posts, right? Posts, right? Because it kept. Wow. But we also know that recommender engines can really, can really, you know, use algorithms to capture attention uh, using feedback loops. So, for example, the TikTok recommender engine tracks very carefully what what you watch, what you like, and then you know it turn then you know it turns the information into an algorithm uh, videos that you're more likely to click on and watch watch. Um, there's lots of on the internet that are social systems, like email systems, like email slash social systems because they use a common framework for communication. There are there are conventions and norms that are associated with these systems. One understands what these conventions are. And we are social creatures. We seek social award, social rewards. And so um, there's things like social capital. That, that affect our behavior. You know, I affect our behavior. You know, I, I'm going to, you're going to answer my peer influence, uh, influence uh, affects us. Our identity, some people have their online identity than they are their real life identity. And of course, power plays a role. You're going to pay attention to that email sent from your manager, right? And it turns out that there, it's out that there, it's asymmetrical. People of lower order status pay to people of a higher status than vice versa. Okay, the design of the internet mirrors how our mind structure, structures information. So 1945, Vanna Barber uh, was the head of the U.S. office, uh, head of the U.S. office of science. And he, he managed 6,000 people. And at the time, the Dewey Decimal System, system was the way that information was organized. And he said, no, Vannevar Bush said, there's gotta be a better way because this is not how, way because this is not how people's minds work. People, patients, let's organize information based on, the, based on the associations that the information has with each other. So this maps on so well to the, the well, to the theory of antic memory, which is a theory of minds. Uh, organize uh, memories. And so, especially when you don't have a strong mind, imagine you're reading a Wikipedia page and all page and all kinds of associated, and then you see a link and you click on that. And then you see reading and all kinds of other associations come to mind. You see another link. Ah, you're primed to be thinking of that idea. Click on that. Before you know it, you're joy writing. Before you know it, you're joy writing through the web. Because the design is so well to how our minds, uh, memory in our minds are organized, are organized. Uh, now I want to talk about the broader media and media environment. Um, so claim causality here. I'm simply going to say that there's things in film, TV, commercials that reinforce our already short attention attention span. So when film and TV out, uh, shot lengths were much longer, so 13 seconds, 12 seconds, and they have also shrunk down to an average of roughly about uh, yeah uh, yeah it's about three four it's about three four seconds and uh, film and TV editors and directors, the editors and directors are the ones who design shot lengths of how long these shot lengths should be. What influences their decision? Well, it could be that they're gearing shot lengths to what they think our attention spans are, for what they think will cap for what they think will capture our attention. Uh, it could be their own already short attention spans. It's a chicken and egg, chicken and egg problem. We we don't know what's influencing what. My <laughs> argument is that it's it's reinforcing short forcing short attention span, even though we can't claim causality. So let me um, head to the third of the talk, which is what we can do. Right? And there are things we could do. We, we can learn to gain control 
over our attention. We can gain agency. And how can we and how can we do it? A number of things we can do. And I, I'm just going to talk about a, few, about a few of them. The vertical thing that we do when we do, when we run a to-do list, you write a list of things that you want to do that day. And then you usually associate a time, usually associate a time with it, right? You're, you're going to finish writing chapter or this section of paper by 11 o'clock. And you're going to do something else and finish it by one o'clock. We do that without any consideration of the idea that the idea that the mind has the limited attentional resource and the idea that we have rhythms in our attention and in our attention. And so consider instead personal rhythm of attention is it's easy to do, right? Right. You can take a, you know, carry I've had my students do this um, or you know, discover your chronotype. You can take what's called chronotype. You can take what's called the morningness, eveningness questionnaire for what your chronotype is. Design your day, day based on your own personal rhythm of when your peak attire and plan to do the hardest tasks, hardest tasks, the tasks that are the most creativity at the right. And when your attention wanes, you know, then you do subordinate, subordinate work that doesn't require a lot of attention. So uh, when I visited, I visited Kyoto, this was probably around 2015 or so, um, I visited the Ryoanji Gardens, which is just the most beautiful, uh, it's like a meditative garden. And there's a, a, there's a, a phrase in Japan, which is called Yi. And this is a picture that I took, by the way, of the gardens. And yohaku no bi, and yohaku no bi refers to of empty space. When when we when we design our day, when we schedule our day, we doubt it in terms of the tasks, the work that has to be done, and we don't give attention attention to um, times that we need to step back. And those times are real times are really important. Um, right that I started off as an artist, and as an artist, an artist, and as an artist, we learn about what's called negative surrounds the figure, and it's really important because it's the des the design of that space around the of that space around the figure is off. It creates dynamism for the figure, and it's the same the figure. And it's the same, of, you know, the space around these rocks, designing your day, design in empty space. What do you do in the empty space? It's time to meditate, contemplate, take a walk. You can even do, you can even do rote activity, but it's time to see your resources to replenish. It's really important. important. It's important for well-being. So, what I would like to do is I'd like is I'd like to refresh about our tech use, right? We're we're given these tools that can enhance our capabilities, and instead of thinking about in terms of you know how can we push ourselves to our absolute limits to be as productive as possible, let's instead think about how we can achieve higher quality attention, and when we do that. And when we do that in first, productivity will follow as a, as a book, as a, as a byproduct. There, there's a theory in psychology, the old theory, which shows that when people feel positive, that when people feel positive, and it's just a, a really interesting study where people, emotions were elicited, were elicited in people. They either watched films that made them, or films that really made them feel positive. And when they were in the condition that watched these really positive films, people actually, you know, proved to be more creative. They could generate, they could generate more ideas. They proved more. So let's think of putting well-being first. Let's, you know, give, let's, you know, give that a lot of attention in our. Um, this work could not have been done. done without all my really, really fantastic colleagues. I'm very grateful to them. Now, if you see your name 
If you see your name on here, you might think, wait a minute, you're scratching your head. I need papers or <laughs> design any papers with, with her. But we've had discussions in some form or another, and you participated in making this work, in making this work possible. Because collaboration is not just about, you know, writing a paper or doing an analysis. It's also about, about generating <laughs> ideas and getting feedback. So I really, really will extend so much thanks, so much thanks and grad these great, uh, wonderful colleagues that I've had over the years. And I did a, um, I took my, titles by publications and authors mm -hmm. and did a word cloud and did a word cloud mm -hmm. and and this is what it looks like mm -hmm. the interaction information work association work social come up and what's the up there at the top and Latin and, and uh, Grover is there on the left I, there's everybody is in there so I really would like to thank you all very much. Um, what I spoke about today is written in a trade book. It's not a book. It's not an academic book. It's a trade book called Attention Span, uh, if you're interested. Um, and I also have a... And I also have a, a sub stack where I, I write about these ideas. Would love to get your feedback and... Uh, uh, would like to thank you again for the I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity my work and Gloria has a couple of copies to keep away after this <laughs> oh, <laughs> I slept yeah, 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 yeah. thank you thank you he, he's trying to clean it. <laughs> so uh, uh, happy if anyone has any questions or comments, happy to. Yes, Eric. I wonder about the, <clears throat> kind of the, <clears throat> kind of the context of, I mean, we live in a competitive capitalistic society and there are all kinds of forces around us that are, are demanding our attention because they want to make money. Or yeah. We want to shape our views and so on, and <clears throat> isn't the question are there? I mean, so that's one one part, but the other part are there are there one part, but the other part are there are there other cultures that have a less distractibility structure to them, structure to them. So um, the the first, of course, we're we're facing gale force winds. Yeah. That is winds. Yeah. That it. Is, Absolutely not. And, you know, we're um, up against very sophisticated technology, technology that keeps learning about every time we go on the web, right? It, it gets me pretty angry when, you know, when I see how, how my behavior is being used uh, against me. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's not an easy task. Um, let me also mention that a lot of people recommend taking a digital detox. Yeah. detox now yes that's that's great and it's like doing a crash diet it, it'll work sure sure you might go off tech for two days and you'll feel great and then you come back and you're back to the same place you work place you work so you know we're we live in a tech world we can't go back we have to learn how to use technology wisely and i would love to see regulations put on tech companies. I would like to see laws, like to see laws like the L law that's in France with um, the right to digitally disconnect. And, and so for the Alcari law, if you're all not familiar with it, um, it's France, it's Ontario, Canada, Ireland. It's the, it's the idea that not be penalized if they do not answer electronic communications after work hours, protects workers. It's like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's very important. And I would love for that law to law to be enacted. So that those are things that can help in laws like that. In terms of cultures, yes, there are other cult cultures. Yes, there are other cultures that are less competitive though colleagues. In Asian countries, they tell me they have the same problem. They have the same problems with 
distractions. <laughs> and I know it did with uh, we shouldn't be in Korea. And we looked at that and we looked at students um, use of devices and it's it, just as bad as it is here. Yes. This might be my one and only to mention my deep psychology past. You talked about semantics. You talked about semantic memory and uh, automatic process. My one and only publication in memory and cognition. My colleagues and I when my colleagues and I were able to take activation. So this is a, a technique for measure a technique for measuring the spread of activation in some priming word. There's a lot of ways to do it, but one way is to show a priming word and then show a target that's either a word or not a word, and it's called lexical decision of people. So we gave uh, subjects subjects an attentive task to carry out on the priming. You do that, you don't find any evidence, evidence of spread, spreading activation. So that was oh. that was a pretty interesting finding. Oh, that's yeah. a momentary thing um i think you could add i think you could add this to your argument the need for rote or you know empty space because when you're attending really and focused it may inhibit spreading activation to some oh. extent and so you're maybe less creative you know it's fatiguing so, thank you wow well That's hey good. whenever i'll never have a chance again to say <laughs> never have a chance again to say <laughs> when he's talking about priming it's like if you see a word like bird bird and then you see sparrow you you respond faster than if you get a word like chair or right. a nonsense chair or right. a nonsense word cool <laughs> <laughs> yes it seems like a lot of your work implies, work implies uh, productivity and the, the desire for paper productivity. But I, uh, you also showed this interesting slide about how television and film have started taking shorter, shorter cuts uh, as a way of kind of priming uh, energy. I think, I think actually, I, I mean, I was I first noticed this TV came on the scene, and everything was a, a second long and that kind of both, right? Yeah. And uh, so I wonder if you could talk for a moment. So I wonder if you could talk for a moment, since you have an artistic background also, about the affect filmmakers might use it to energize people, how they might appeal to younger people by making certain speeds of yeah. things like that. Yeah, a great example is Michael Bay's work. If you ever watch the Transformer films, the Transformer films, has anyone ever watched Transformers? <laughs> they switch shots like every two seconds. Um, it's crazy, and there's like Transformers 1, 2, 3, and for every sequel, the shot lengths get shorter. And um, there, I, um, there I, I believe they're in done to, you know, keep, uh, keep, you know, keep people activated. The, the problem, though, is that um, you can watch it, and it's hard, and I've done this, right? I, I study these films. It's hard to really, to really... Um, straight together to make a cohesive narrative it's more like it's just different scenes it's just different scenes being thrown at you check your smartphone and then come back and you haven't missed anything <laughs> anything right it, it's called chaos editing right <laughs> editing it's it's just to make impressions and impressions and but you apprehend and anything deep. and you know it's the, this is this is where film is heading. There are, of course, many longer shot lengths, you know, more thoughtful, considerable considerations. So if the listener, the watcher, has time to enter into the film and be able to, to get absorbed in it. But this new trend of these like, short shot lengths. Another example is YouTube. There is YouTube. There are jump cuts are used a lot. You know what a jump cut is? It's like a really abrupt transition between scenes and there are scenes and there are to YouTube, um, you know, people who want to put up a YouTube movie, there are movie, there are tutorials to teach you how to cut a lot non-necessary uh, words like filler words like ums and ohs. And the result, at least in my view, is that it makes speech more unnatural, right? I mean, right? I mean, um, oh, that's part of what makes us, and we're losing that in, in the record, in the digital record when we watch YouTube. So that's, that's also happened. So, you know, young people are being raised 
in in a in in a culture of these fast shop changes, which will you know appear normal to them, right? Normal to them, right? Yeah. Okay. Question about the graph of uh, engagement versus difficulty. Yeah. Um, so when my low engagement happens with something that's difficult, it became frustrating. Became frustrating. But what about when I'm intentionally building management where I want a background process, right? So I, 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 I don't have to focus. The challenge is still there. I'm not necessarily frustrated. I'm just mulling it over in the back. Okay, you're challenged and not really engaged. Right. So, so I'm I'm wrestling with the problem. Yeah. And then I do that for 15 minutes. And then I go, let me go take a walk. And I'm looking at birds and I'm looking at other kinds of things. And in the meantime, I'm still sort of engaged, oh, but not that okay. heavy focus engaged. Yeah. 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 So right. So um ideas can incubate in our minds. So if we if we have a tough so if we if we have a tough problem, it's a really good strategy. And the the idea though, our minds are still working in the background. <laughs> And it's called incubation. And it actually turns out, you talked about going outside. It turns out that research shows that, research shows that even a 20-minute walk in nature can really de-stress people. And work that I did with Mary and um, Saeed, Saeed. Saeed Abdullah yeah. found that 20 minutes outside, outside led people to significantly better diverging, which is like brainstorming. So people came up with more ideas just being outside. I was very curious about what is this role in nature, and I looked into it. There, so, so the short answer is no one really, but there are two theories. The first theory is called attentional restoration theory, which is restoration theory, which is the idea that you know when you pull away it's diffuse when you're outside. There's so many different things to things to you know, different signals to be taking in, it gives us a chance to restore our resources. The second theory, the second theory, it's a, an evolutionary perspective, you know, we feel safer in a natural environmental environment than we do in a built environment. So take those with a great, but, you know, I'm just saying this is what um, two, um, two theories. Yes. Yes. Uh, so well, this is really fascinating. I love. I could ask questions about many things. Um, but I, um, but I was uh, kind of piqued by first about weightlifting. Yeah. And how we can't weightlift all day long. Um, and day long. Um, and you mentioned that you also know that you get injured. Um, mm -hmm. which made me wonder. Which made me wonder if there's a um dealing with the idea of attentional injury um and you know you, you talked about how the, the blood flow to the brain is there a sense in which the brain gets the brain gets injured or whatever attention is injured, um through overuse and through this kind of hyper focused um attentional state that we yeah. We're being encouraged to begin. What, to begin. what what a great question. What a great question. Um the, so burnout is the extreme state of extreme state of exhaustion. It's it's not but it's really you know quite a, a, a very deep state of exhaustion. So that's that's the closest I, I can think of. But it's a really but it's a really great question. Well, it is really interesting. It could be that some of the disorders that we have, where we have, where people are hyper focused, you know, attention deficit disorder, um, Asperger's, mm -hmm. have some explanation, oh. explanation oh. involving the brain for this, things that are not yet understood. Yeah, good point. Ted. Yeah, I'm, I'm really familiar with your like Skype and screen switching. I just wonder what your perspective on like how much is this screen switching problem? Like how much is that actually like problem for attention? Because I always now that I'm in the industry, I I realize so much of just I realize so much of just 
just does that. It's like if I'm copying over stats from stats from R into this other document, like I just have to go back on sure. I just have to go. And I've always wondered, like, I don't know. I know we never really researched it, but went into much, but like if people have looked into better UI designs that can kind of just like take that take that super common task of just not that you're being scrapped with one thing to the other. Seems like a no-brainer, right? Yeah. <laughs> it seems like it should be done, right? It would make our lives so much easier. I, I know so many times, like I like I still have to copy to copy this code and paste here and oh it like can't we do better in the, like can't we do better in this day and age? So it be able to do that, yeah. But you know, th those are those are like intentional kinds of, but there's so many cases that we, you know, we self-interrupt and um, interrupt. And um, and I, I noticed that on myself. I mean, we did look at our data where we we differ differentiated the external interruptions, that's from external stimulus, from internal interruptions for people interruptions, for people interrupt own volition. And we found internal interruptions in one hour waned. The the number of internal interruptions <laughs> increased. It suggests to me, this is how I interpret it, that we that we are to being interrupted, to having short attention spans, that if an interruption doesn't come externally, we, we take over. We do it on our on our own. We're just you know changing our attention. Attention. I don't know if I can frame this as a question. So every morning I take our dog for a walk for about half an hour, 40 minutes. And, and when she was, a, she would like to follow scents and I would let her follow and I would let her follow the scent. She was very creative for a long period of time. And then she'd eventually give up and she'd follow some other trail. And I just let her do that. And when we get to a street now, um, Sometimes people come down. Sometimes people come down the street, and she attends to that, especially if they come with a dog, right? Well, at first, when she was a puppy, she she didn't pay attention until they got close. Now, she interrupts herself, if you will, like like we're near an area where there we're near an area where there might be a person. Yeah. See if anybody's coming down the street. Nope. <laughs> nope. Back to, work. <laughs> Back to work, seeing the wood. And uh, so it, it's weird. I just wonder if, if our society is, is actually you know, like dogs. creeping in, <laughs> like <Dogs>. creeping in. <laughs> I can't help myself. But if our society is going to the dogs, not in the sense of, of going to the dogs, but we're injecting our own cult of solarity or whatever you want to call it into call it into other species domestic <laughs> dogs. Well I guess there's that assumes that dogs are picking up on, on yeah, what we're doing. Sure. Um, I I know. Well it's it's <laughs> the environment that they live in is less predictable in a sense than or it's it's more of this scattered thing. You know like in real life if you walk around you walk around, you grab things change as you walk. The trees that are out there, trees that are out there, you know, you get more and more and your viewpoint predictable way. If you're watching TV, it's like bang. In TV, it's like bang. It's a diff it's like completely unpredictable and attention grab, more yeah. so. The, when that happens, when that happens outside, it's because suddenly something leaps from the bushes. You know, you gotta react to it. Right. And now it's like you got to react to it. I mean, already, you know, we're sort of built to react to these things that are unpredicted. Yeah, that's a, that's such an interesting point. Interesting point. So, evolutionary perspective, we would multitask by scanning the environment, looking for planning the environment, looking for predators, looking for danger signals. Yeah, we would respond to it. So, in a sense, we we did multi multitask right for our own default. But now it's a different kind of multitasking because you know because you know we're switching uh, so rapidly. We we it's not based it's not for our survival. 
right? It's yeah, but it's it's happening. Or somebody else is there, I mean, we're we're curious. We're we're human beings. We're we're human beings. We seek awards. I mean, there's so many reasons we keep switching our attention. Yes, yes, Mr. Kopsa. It differs also. But it has in nature is pretty conscious, so it's also capital processing, it's partly the level of the primary, certain things stand out simply, and out simply, that it has this attentional mind. Mm. And we can do the former much better, better than the latter, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, there is some Parallel processing in the amount of using the process. Yeah. People notice certain things again. Subconscious. Well, we mentioned so rapidly, it's both system one and system two. So one and system two. So it's both automatic response, but it's also system two where we can deliberately make a, make a decision. You want to check. You want to check email or go to Facebook or you want to go shopping or whatever, or I want to, or whatever, or I want to look for Wendy's email. So there, it involves both system one and system two. So, yes, I, I do want to say, not surprisingly, we're having a lot more questions and longer conversation than normal, uh, but I want than normal, uh, but I wanted to create space for like students might, or we're having a longer conversation so we can, there's a reception outside, so we can continue the conversation at some. And for those who want to stick around, we can stick in the room and, and ask more questions and ask more questions. Um, yeah. uh, but I want to just make sure we give Gloria a big round round of applause. <laughs> Record this. <laughs> 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 <laughs>